And now we are also on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Hey, I'm Brian Manning, and I'm a political asylum lawyer with Manning Asylum. That's the name of my law firm, and it's based in Houston, Texas, but we help people all over the country to secure their future in America through asylum. So I used to be an asylum officer with the government, but now I'm an asylum lawyer. I want to share a couple of words with you today before getting to your questions. We're going to do questions and answers. So go ahead as I'm talking. Uh, let me know in the comments. First, let me know where you're, where you're watching from. I'd love to see where folks are at. Uh, let me know the city and state that you're watching us from. And, and then go ahead and leave your questions. And I'm going to get to your questions in just a minute. But I want to say a few words first about something that's been coming up a lot lately because a lot of people find themselves in this very weird position. Um, so, but go ahead and leave your, Hey, good to see you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Oh, that's funny. Nice. <laughs> Thanks for, Hey, um, all right. So yeah, go ahead and leave your comments. Uh, Gustavo from Albuquerque. What's up? Thank you for being with us, Gustavo on YouTube. And then we've got Badru, my friend Badru in LA. Thank you. Okay. And Sally is in North Carolina. Thanks for joining us. All right, leave, go ahead and start leaving your questions and I'll get to them in a second. But I want to talk about this. There's a lot of people who have been in immigration court proceedings, but get their case dismissed or dropped. When I say in immigration court proceedings, I mean that you've had to go or you will have to go to an immigration court hearing because the government is trying to deport you. They've issued a letter called a notice to appear that they filed with the court that says, hey, we're trying to deport you. You have to come and show up and you can, uh, you can tell us what your defense is if you have any. Tell us why we shouldn't deport you. And this happens for various reasons that people get put into deportation proceedings. But for many asylum seekers, many of them come to the border, uh, the southern border, without permission to enter, without a visa. And they say, hey, I want asylum. And they get automatically put in deportation proceedings. And they present their asylum case in immigration court. Or if you already have an asylum interview at the asylum office, but the officer didn't agree with you, they said, nope, sorry, you're not eligible for asylum. Well, they put you in deportation proceedings. And then you get another chance in immigration court to try to win your case. But um, you're in deportation proceedings. So here's what happened. The Biden administration a while ago said, you know what? There's a lot of people that are in deportation proceedings that we don't really care about that really aren't a priority for us to deport. Because listen to this, the backlog or, or the amount of cases that are pending in immigration court is over 1.6 million, over 1.6 million pending cases in immigration court. And a lot of those are asylum cases, not all, but a lot of them. So um, basically the Biden administration says, that's ridiculous. You know, these people that like don't have a criminal history, there's no reason to think they're like terrorists or something and don't have anything negative in their history other than maybe, you know, they came without permission or overstayed their visa, uh, well, we don't really care about those people. And we're not going to spend our resources and time of our people trying to deport them or the judges that are hearing these cases. Basically, it's it's just not worth the, the effort and time and money that it takes to pursue some of these people because they're not a big deal. They're not a priority. So the government came up with some standards and said, well, if you, if you meet these certain standards, then we'll be willing to ask the judge, the immigration judge, to drop the case against you. Because the lawyers for ICE, the agency that handles deportations, they can't just um, by themselves say, sorry, like they can't dismiss the case. They can't stop a case by themselves. They have to ask the judge. But what uh, the new policy did by the Biden administration was it gave these ICE lawyers discretion to say, you know what, this case isn't one that we really need to try to deport the person. So we'll ask the judge to drop it, to dismiss is the word they use, dismiss the case. And for a lot of people, this is welcome news. A lot of a lot of people, it's great to have your case dismissed because you being in immigration court proceedings is not good. You're you're close to possibly getting an order of deportation and might even actually get deported. So um, it's not a good place to be. Um, and so a lot of people were very happy that this has happened and, and happy that it happened in their case. And it's still happening, by the way. The government, due to a, a federal court ruling, it's not quite as easy for ICE to get these cases dismissed as it was a few months ago, but it's still happening for certain people. And the thing is, not everyone who has their case dismissed actually wanted their case to be dismissed. Why? Well, because some of them, especially like asylum seekers, they saw that as their only real route to get status because they're not, they don't have any other path to get, to get permanent or even long-term status 
in the United States. And they wanted to have their asylum claim heard. They wanted to get their day in court to explain their asylum case and hopefully win asylum so that they can stay here, right? And then one year after you win asylum, you're eligible to apply for a green card, permanent residence based on your asylee status. And then four years after you get your green card, you're eligible to apply for US citizenship. And so what happens, here's the key, is when a case gets dismissed in immigration court, the asylum case goes away. It just like disappears. It's like it doesn't exist anymore. And so you can't get asylum. You can't get asylum, at least not based on that application. And then the other problem, main problem with getting a case dismissed is that when your asylum case goes away, not only can you not win asylum based on it, but also your work permit that was based on that pending asylum application will stop working because it was based on a pending asylum application and you no longer have a pending asylum application. So that's the problem. So what can you do about this? Well, you can apply with USCIS. This is a, a kind of a tricky subject. There's a lot of unanswered questions in terms of the policies of how USCIS is going to handle these because there's going to be a lot of them because there, there, there's going to be thousands of people that are applying with USCIS after having their case dismissed in immigration court. And there's some kind of thorny, tricky issues that they have to settle, decide how to handle. Probably the biggest thing, though, the most important thing for asylum seekers is the one-year filing deadline. Because remember, there's this rule that says you have to file your asylum application within one year of coming to the United States. And for people that get their case dismissed and then they go back to apply with USCIS, the question is, well, what are they, what's USCIS going to consider the one-year filing date to be? Uh, is it going to be the time that you're filing this application with USCIS now? Or are they going to look at the date on which you filed it uh, previously, whether that was with USCIS or initially with the immigration court? And the good news is that um, USCIS has given guidance to its asylum officers that says, here's how you handle this. Basically, we're going to look at the time that it took the person to file uh, the time between getting the case, the case dismissal in immigration court and the, and the new filing, the refiling with USCIS. Was that a reasonable period of time? Did they file with USCIS within a reasonable time after the case was dismissed in immigration court? And th if, if so, then it's, then it's fine. You will not be barred from getting asylum by the one year filing deadline. Okay. Uh, but uh, if, if, you know, if it's, if it's not a reasonable time, then the asylum officer can say, oh, you, you're barred by the one-year filing deadline. Okay, you can't get asylum because of it. And what counts as a reasonable time is not really concretely defined anywhere. But there is guidance in a, in a very similar context to asylum officers that says, okay, look, like two months is reasonable. Beyond that, it starts to get less reasonable. Uh, and so, you know, what I'm recommending to people is if you think you want to apply for asylum with USCIS after having your case dismissed from the immigration court, you should do it within like the first month after dismissal, definitely within two months or for sure within three months, anything after three. And I think there's a pretty good chance that you'll be barred from getting asylum by the one year filing deadline. OK, so uh, I'm going to make a video for YouTube. Uh, if, if you're not watching that right now on YouTube. Go to my YouTube channel. Uh, it's called Manning Asylum Law and subscribe. And uh, I'm going to put up a video there that's going to address these issues in more detail. Okay. Because there's, there's several other really important things about this that you need to know about that uh, I'm not going to get to today here, but I'm going to put them in a video on YouTube. So go there in the next few days. Uh, you, can, you can check that out. Okay. So um, that's what I wanted to say. The point really is this. You may be able to still get asylum if you applied uh, for asylum, but your case you know, it was pending in immigration court and your case was dismissed or if it gets dismissed because this, this is still happening. If you have an, up, if you have an upcoming immigration court case, um, this, this could happen. The, your, your case could get dismissed, okay? So um, whether you want it to or not. Sometimes the judges care about what you think and whether you want it to get dismissed. Sometimes they don't. But by the way, that question, that decision of whether you want to try to get your case dismissed or not is really a really important one and it's tricky and it depends on the, the the facts of your case and your situation that's something that i think you should talk to an asylum lawyer about okay so uh, by the way if you want to call us and talk about your situation we'd love to talk with you so our number is 713-909-0401 713-909-0401 on youtube and twitter you can see it uh, above me and below me right now 
and on uh, that's on YouTube and Facebook and other uh, platforms. Check out my profile. The number will be there. Okay. Or you can Google Manning Asylum Law. I'll take you to our website, which is manningasylumlaw.com. So um, yeah, we'd love to talk with you in an, an asylum strategy session where we will uh, explore your case and tell you whether we think we can help you. And if so, we'll tell you exactly how we would do that. Okay. So we'd love to talk with you. Give us a call. So with that, uh, let's take it over to some questions. Abe or Abe says, hi, Brian. Hello, Abe, Chico, how are you? Nabin says, uh, hello as well. Hello, Brian, sir. Hello to you. Good day to you. Okay, let's see what we have. Um, all right, so on TikTok, we have a question. Yesterday was my finger, my your, your fingerprints or biometrics for asylum. I entered the country legally. So what's the next step? So whether you, it doesn't matter whether you are, uh, you came with a visa and are applying for asylum with USCIS or you came to the border without a visa and are applying with the immigration court, the, the process is, well, the process is not exactly the same, but it, 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 in this sense, if you, if you had your biometrics appointment, right? After you apply for asylum, the next thing is you get a biometrics appointment where you go to an office of USCIS and they take your photograph and your fingerprints and they use this data for background checks. They do this for all people that are applying for an immigration benefit, okay, in the United States. And the next step, if you're with USCIS, is going to be the interview. And there's a pretty good chance that you'll get that interview soon, like within the next month or two, okay? Um, it, there's no guarantee. You, you, you can never say for sure with timelines with USCIS or with the immigration court, really. But based on our experience, we've seen a lot of people, if they, especially if you applied recently, there's a good chance that you will, and now you've got your biometrics, there's a pretty good chance you will get the interview notice in the next few weeks. The interview notice is a letter that says, hey, your interview has been scheduled on X date, see you then. And so the time between getting that interview notice letter and the day of your actual interview is usually like 10 to 14 days. You have usually a little bit less than two weeks from the time that you get the letter that says, hey, interview scheduled to the day of the interview. So there's not much time to to prepare. So you want to have everything prepared before that. Okay. And we help people do that. Even people that are people that have already applied for asylum. We have, we have clients that we help from the beginning with the application materials to the end. But then we also have clients that hire us after they've already applied, but then they decide, you know what, I want to strengthen my case. I want to do more to bolster, enhance my case and, and to prepare for the interview or for the court hearings. Uh, and so we do that. So, so feel free to call us if you want to talk about how we might be able to help your your case okay um okay so thank you for the question on tiktok let's go to youtube uh mapalita says in chicago says please address uh, what to do when uscis referred my case to immigration court what should be my first step uh, hire an immigration lawyer hire an asylum lawyer if you haven't done that yet that should be your first step i think I mean, statistically speaking, a study showed that you're, you're much, much, much more likely to win in immigration court with a, with a lawyer. So I recommend that you do that. Um, and then, you know, you, uh, I assume you mean your case was referred by an asylum office, like you had an asylum interview and the officers there thought that you didn't qualify. They, they decided Mapolita does not qualify for asylum. And so we're sending them to immigration court. So you need to you need to do better. You got to strengthen your case. Okay, you gotta you gotta you gotta find more and better evidence. You've got to have a great declaration where you set forth in writing why you're eligible, what's happened, and why you're afraid to go back to your country to show the judge that you meet all the requirements for asylum. Um, and you got to be ready to explain your case in immigration court. And that stuff's hard. It's hard. Okay, um, so uh, you may want to consider getting professional help to to do that. Okay. Uh, so, okay, follow-up question. We'll take this follow-up question from Mapolita that says, can I get the work, WP I think means work permit, or formally these are, it's called an employment authorization document, right? Can you get that work permit um, when your asylum case is referred to immigration court? Yes. You can still get it. And if you already, if someone already has one based on their pending asylum case, and then they have the interview and then their case gets sent to immigration court, you can keep working legally on that card. Um, and if you don't have one yet, you can get one while you're in immigration court proceedings. Okay. 
And also if you appeal, if you, if you go through immigration court proceedings and you get a negative decision there, you can appeal that decision. And while your appeal is pending with the next body up called the Board of Immigration Appeals, you can keep working or apply for a work permit then and, and renew your work permit too if you need to. Okay. Um, Badru in LA says, how soon can someone up on YouTube says, how soon can someone apply for a refugee travel document after winning asylum? How long does it take to be processed? Uh, immediately. They can apply immediately. Like, you know, the day after you get your asylum approval notice, you can, you can apply for a refugee travel document. How long does it take to be processed? I don't know. You'll have to, you'll have to check that. I would Google USCIS processing times. Um, I, I think I posted, I think it was last night that I posted a video on TikTok and YouTube shorts uh, where I show you how to, how to look up processing times, a, a real quick video. So look at my YouTube shorts and my TikToks from my, I think it was yesterday. Uh, if not, it was like the day before about uh, a, a show I screen recorded on my phone about how to quickly look up processing times, okay? To, to, an, to try to answer your second question because I, I don't know off the top of my head. But I know, I think it's a while, unfortunately, Badra. I think it's not like a couple months. I think it's like a year or something, unfortunately. So keep that in mind as you plan, unfortunately. Um, sometimes you can get those expedited. Like if there's emergency circumstances, like you really need to travel for some urgent reason, you can sometimes get those sped up, okay? Um, uh, this is a deep question. Why do asylum app uh, from soccer top 10, why do asylum applications take so long? Well, there's a lot of people that want asylum. There's a lot of people who have applied for asylum and there's not a whole lot of asylum officers and infrastructure and, and judges in the courts to, to handle this. Um, yeah, it's just, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of cases and the government has never really prioritized you know, giving the resources that are needed to handle this stuff quickly. It is going quickly for most people who have applied recently because of a policy change in 2018 where the government said, you know what, instead of when someone applies, taking their application, you know, putting them in the, in the line, in the back of the line where how, you know, how lines normally work, right? When you get into a line, you're at the back of it, right? You're going to have to wait the longest. Well, the government changed that and they reversed it. They said, okay, starting now from like January 2018, starting now, when someone applies, they're not going to go to the back of line, the back of line. Instead, we're going to process them right away. As soon as they apply, we're going to try and get them the interview as soon as possible, like within a couple months. So people who apply now, it's usually not taking that long. Um, it's, it's usually they get their interview in two or three months and then in, often the decision in a few weeks. But even, even after the interview, soccer top 10, it takes, it can take a while to get the decision. Okay. Sometimes it takes, um, weeks sometimes even longer to get the decision okay which is which is a pain and what why does that happen why does it take a long time after the interview to get the decision um i made a video that i posted on youtube recently about this the the video has like asylum decisions or something in the title look at my my most recent few videos that i posted on youtube i talk more in more detail about some of the reasons for that okay check that out that being said i'm from nepal nice thanks for being with us um Yep. So Pradeep says, Hey, can you tell me about mandamus lawsuit and asylum pending case? Yeah, you should. A mandamus lawsuit, for those of you who don't know, is where you sue the government to try to make it do its job. The government's supposed to act in a reasonable period of time on any immigration case, right? And if they don't, you can sue them and ask a federal judge to tell them, to tell the asylum office, for example, in this case, that they have to do their job. They have to give you your interview, or if you've already had your interview and you're waiting for a decision, they have to give you that decision. They have to make a decision and give it to you. So the, the thing is, the government has to act in a reasonable time, okay? Um, and the what what is reasonable is not clearly defined anywhere, but really, I think most immigration lawyers tend to agree, and I, I think that after about three years, if, if your case has been pending for about three years, uh, whether you've gotten the interview not yet or not, if you've been waiting three years and don't have a decision yet, you're probably at a place where you can consider suing. Okay, you can cons you 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 can actually threaten to sue first. You can say write a letter to the asylum office saying, if you don't give me my interview in the next thirty days, I'm going to have to sue. Please give me my interview. And we had success with this recently with the Miami asylum office with a person who had been waiting I think five years for their interview, and we sent that letter. And 
like a week later, they got their interview. So it was fast. So you have you got to know if you threaten to sue or you actually sue, you got to be ready. You got to have your, your your documents in order and be ready to go because you might get your interview right away. Okay. Um, how can I talk? So on TikTok, how can I talk to you by phone? I'm on my way to the border because I had to run for my country. Well, first of all, I'm sorry to hear that you, know, that you had to do that. That's that's tough. I imagine that must be very, very difficult. So I'm sorry you're in this position. And be careful on the way to the border. It's it's rough. It's dangerous. The area around the border, the U.S. I assume you mean the U.S.-Mexico border. It's it's rough. So be careful. Uh, how can you talk to us? You can you can call us. Uh, my in, in TikTok, go up to my profile. At the top is my my number seven one three nine zero nine zero four zero one. Thank you for commenting and good luck. Uh, so let's see soccer top, oh so I want to address this even though I already addressed one of your questions soccer top 10 says my friend's asking if she can win asylum based on FGM yes in general that is something that can make for a good asylum claim FGM means female genital mutilation um, it's a practice that is that happens in several places in the world um, predominantly more so in, in Africa and uh, the Middle East uh, and it is, yeah, it's been recognized as something that can get you asylum. So remember, to win asylum, it's not enough just to show that you uh, have been persecuted or that there's a chance that you're going to be persecuted in the future. Rather, you also have to show uh, that the persecution is on account of, or that basically means motivated by, inspired by, motivated at least in significant part by, the fact that you possess one of five protected characteristics under U.S. asylum law. And those are your race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and something called membership in a particular social group. And uh, it, you may be thinking, well, where does FGM fit into one of those? It's not like race. It's not religion. Uh, it's It fits under that last one called membership in a particular social group. Federal judges, judges have said and the immigration authorities have said, okay, yeah, FGM, that counts as... Uh, membership in a particular social group persecution. So the answer is yes, that can be a valid basis to win asylum. It's not guaranteed just because someone has undergone FGM or fears undergoing being forced to undergo it. It's not a guaranteed win. I mean, you have to establish eligibility from, you know, asylum based on all the criteria, but yeah, that can make for a good case. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, all right, so Giovanni says, uh, hope you're great. I had a question. How long has it recently taken your clients to get their green card after asylum? I saw your recent video, hard to think it is 40 months. Well, I don't have any who have gotten it because I've only I've only had my law firm for three years, uh, not even three years, closer to two and a half. I was, so remember before this, I was an asylum lawyer at the Houston Asylum Office. And so I've just, I've only been an asylum lawyer for a few years. And um so I, it, it, as you note, as you saw in my video, it's taking a long time to get a green card based on um, asylee status. So I haven't, I haven't been, at, I haven't been at it long enough to have any of my clients go through and get their green card. They're pending, but it's, but they're pending. So uh, yeah, no, it really is. It really is several years. Um, so that's unfortunate. It's really unfortunate, but it is what it is. So yep. Sorry to not have better news on that one, Giovanni. Uh, Oguz, sorry if I mispronounced that. Is that Turkish, Oguz? It seems like it's, it might be Turkish. Um, by the way, I've appreciated your videos. It's so much helping us. You're, oh, wait, let me thank, thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, okay, so he said up above, hey, I gave my biometrics today for an affirmative asylum case. How long does it take to proceed with an interview at Chicago office? Um, I was sort of speaking to this earlier. If th there's a good chance it could be very soon, there's a good chance you could have your interview in like a month or two months. Uh, no guarantees, but there's a pretty good chance. Uh, Oguj, did you did you apply recently, like within the last four months? If so, then I would say definitely a very good chance that you'll get your interview very soon if you had your biometrics today. Hope it went well. Uh, okay, Faig. Sorry if I mispronounced that. It says, can I apply for an EB2 and dismiss my asylum case in court if my EB will be approved? Whether you qualify for an EB2 or really any other kind of status that's like business or investment based, um, 
is tricky. Okay. And it's not my area to be honest with you. I, so, so I just focus really on asylum law. All right. Um, my advice is you should probably talk to a lawyer who focuses on EB twos. Okay. Uh, because in some cases so th th there's some nuance here in like whether you can qualify to change status to something else. If you've um, applied for asylum and had like asylum pending and like, it depends on when you, when you applied for asylum, like was it before or after you lost your, whatever status you used to have, if you had status, it's, it's a bit, it's a little bit complicated is what I'm saying. So, so I would talk with a lawyer who focuses on, on, on EB2 visas or at least business or investment based visas. So, uh, you know, my, my advice is when you have a problem, a serious problem or a serious thing you need done, you should work with the person who focuses on that problem. All right. So, you know, when you go to the doctor, if you have a, a heart problem, you know, you don't, you, well, you might start with a general practitioner, the general doc, family doctor, but they send you to a specialist. They send you to the heart doctor and they don't send you to just any specialist. They don't send you to the neurologist who deals with brain issues or some other specialist. They send you to the cardiologist, the person who does the heart issues. So that's kind of how I look at immigration law. It's like, I do asylum. That's what I think I know really well and what I have unique insider experience in. But by the way, uh, for those who just joined us, I'm Brian Manning and I'm an asylum lawyer. And I used to be an asylum officer uh, with the government. And before that, I was a diplomat. And so I've worked for 11 years for the government's two main agencies for refugee and, affair, and, and asylum matters. Uh, as far as I know, I'm the only lawyer who has been an immigration officer with both. The only, I'm the only immigration lawyer that I know of who's been an immigration officer with both the Department of State and the Department of Homeland Security. So I think I, I have some unique perspectives that I think can help my clients. Uh, but the point of saying all that is uh, talk to talk to the person who specializes in the thing that you need or the, the area that you need help in, okay? Oh, to go back to Ogush, who I asked, I asked when you applied, because he said that he had his biometrics appointment today. He said he applied just 21 days ago. So yeah, it's going, it's going quickly in your case. Did you apply online, Ogush, to keep the conversation going? Um, uh, because uh, I'm guessing you did, because usually it's going much, much, much faster if you apply online. By the way, you can apply for asylum online with USCIS <laughs> uh, in most cases. Most people don't know that. Most immigration lawyers don't know that. But then again, most immigration lawyers don't know that much about asylum because it's a very specialized subset of U.S. immigration law that uh, is, is complicated, it's nuanced. And if you're not spending your time, your days obsessing over it like we do, then you're probably going to be behind. So um, uh, interesting. Yeah, I, wish I, bet, I bet he applied online. So Fying said, can you advise someone? Yeah, that's, that's what we do all day, every day. Give us a call. The number on, on YouTube and, and Facebook is above my head. Uh, and on uh, other platforms, including TikTok, it's up in my profile. Yeah, he says the problem is to find the correct lawyer. Yep, a lot of bad ones out there. I was actually shocked when I was in a uh, asylum officer with the government. I was, I was surprised at how bad the lawyers were. Like I uh, had this expectation that they would be good, and they weren't. Most of them didn't didn't do really anything to help their clients. They like maybe gave some advice on how to fill out the application form, and that's it. They didn't they didn't write out like an argument, like a brief or anything explaining why their clients should get asylum, why they're eligible for asylum. And they didn't do much to prepare them for the interview. It's, you know, it's usually what I could gather. It's usually with most immigration lawyers. It's like, Oh, don't worry about the asylum interview. We'll, we'll talk for like 15 minutes beforehand, like right before the interview that day, we'll, we'll, I'll, we'll go over a couple of the questions I'll probably ask you. It'll be cool. Don't worry about it. No insufficient. That's, that's not enough. The interview is hard. Okay. It's much harder than what people expect. The officer doesn't just let you explain yourself and tell your story. Rather, they're asking you question after question after question after question. They're constantly interrupting you. They're changing topics frequently. And some of them are anti-immigrant and they're looking for an excuse to deny you. They're, some of them are playing word games with you so that you will make mistakes. So they'll have an excuse to deny you. Okay. So if, if, you're, if you're shopping for immigration lawyers, Faig, um, ask them what they're going to do to help you. So to ask them, like, what, what will you do for my case? If they just say, oh, we'll advise you. That's too vague, too nebulous. That's not good enough. You need to ask them to be concrete about what they're going to do to help you. So in addition with us, in addition to the application materials and me writing a legal brief where I explain exactly why they're eligible, 
part of the preparation, the most important part is the mock interview that we're going to do, the practice interview, where we do everything that they're going to experience on the day of the real interview. So then they go into it knowing what kind of questions to expect, knowing what it feels like to be in this position, knowing what all the different procedures for the day are. All this helps you to feel more comfortable and confident and ready to do a good job. So that's that. Um, all right. So in the line of fire says, can you explain on YouTube says, can you explain the difference uh, between applying with USCIS or going through the courts under what conditions do you have a choice? Can you switch to courts if USCIS is delaying instead of suing? No, you don't have a choice. No, you can't switch to the courts, unfortunately. Yeah, there's no choice. You, you cannot apply with the court unless you are already in deportation proceedings. So yeah, you, like if you, if you try to, if you just try to file an application with the court, they'll, they'll go, they'll check for your A number in their systems and they'll say, oh, you don't have a case in immigration court. You're not in deportation proceedings. Therefore we cannot accept your application. We'll send it back to you. So no, there's no choice. Uh, but I mean, how it works is if you're not in deportation proceedings, then your only choice is to apply with USCIS. If you are in deportation proceedings, then your only choice is to apply with the immigration court. So it's all about whether you're in deportation proceedings. And you, if you have an asylum application pending already with USCIS, you're not going to get put in deportation proceedings, almost certainly, unless you get a negative decision from the asylum office and they transfer your case to immigration court and put you in deportation proceedings. Okay. So, uh, you know, you ask, can you switch the courts if USCIS is delaying instead of suing? No. And really suing is probably the only chance, realistic chance you have to make it move faster. Well, you, every, you should understand everyone that the, another route to getting your interview is if you can point to some kind of emergency circumstances that would be made better if you were to be able to get your interview and get your asylum decision and move on with your life. Usually this is like health stuff, like mental health or physical health. Like if someone is very depressed, and a mental health professional, like a doctor or a psychologist or social worker, sees them and does a consultation with them and stuff and, and can write a letter that says, this person has these problems, uh, they're depressed, PTSD, whatever it is, and all the uncertainty surrounding their immigration situation is making it worse. Like it's it's, it's exacerbating it's, the situation, it's making it worse. And I think that if they were to get this behind them, this immigration situation, they would probably it would be good for them. It'd be good for their health. That can be a reason to expedite a case, okay, for them to give you the interview sooner. Also, if you have family members abroad who are eligible for you to, who would be eligible for you to bring them here once you win asylum, and those family members abroad are like in danger, or maybe they have some health need that can only be met, that cannot be met in their country, but could be met in the United States, that can be a reason to expedite. So, but that would have to be your spouse or your children who are under age 21, or at least were under age 21 when you applied for asylum and are not married. They have to both have been under 21 when you applied and still at the present moment when you're asking for this benefit or you're asking for this expedite unmarried, okay? So that is uh, how it works, okay? Uh, Fyde says, yes, you have very good knowledge. Thank you, appreciate that, very kind. Thank you for, uh, for being on and for talking with us. Okay. Ogush says, I came here because I'm a Christian and president opened an investigation against me to put me in jail. I'm a defense advisor and former UN officer. Do you think it's, I'm guessing maybe like a good case? Um, it just depends. I mean, what, why did the... Why did the president open the investigation against you to put you in jail? Is it because you're a Christian? And if so, can you, can, what, what evidence or even circumstantial evidence indicates that that's the case? Okay. Is there things that people have said or done that shows us, ah, yes, that's the reason. Okay. If so, if we can convince the officer of that, then yeah, that's a pretty good case. If, if it doesn't matter what country you're from, if there's a very real chance that you're going to get put in jail especially long-term because of your religion, then yeah, that would be a good asylum case. Okay. And he said, he said, yes, I applied online. So there you go, everyone. Uh, Ogush said that he got his, uh, he had his biometrics appointment today after applying just 21 days ago online. So uh, that goes to my point that it goes much, 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 much faster if you apply online. Um, 
people who are applying on paper, like by mail, are it's taking like three or four months for them recently to get the uh, receipt notice, the letter that says, okay, we got your asylum application, it's pending. And because you can't get the biometrics until that happens. And you can't get the interview until the biometrics happens. So basically, if you apply by mail on paper, you're you're gonna if you're delaying, you're slowing things down by like three or four months. Ogus applied online. He got his biometrics appointment. Had it 21 days later. Very good chance that he's going to get his interview in the next month or two. Okay. Uh, all right. Fag says, "Okay, I'll call you. Thank you. Good. We look forward to talking with you." Uh, Ogur says, "You think it's a solid case as a former officer? Turkey's under watch because it's a Christian persecution." Uh, I, I still stand by my prior comments. If you can, if you can um, point to things that show us that show the officer that it's something bad could happen to you because of your religion, or maybe political opinion too. There's there's lots of political opinion cases from Turkey. Then yeah, it could be good. But we'd have to you know have to uh, dig into the the details to tell you whether I think it's how, how strong I think it is. You know, you can never say for for sure. There are people that have really strong cases or what should be a really strong case, really good facts. Um, and they're smart, sophisticated people. They put together a good case. They still sometimes lose just because that's the way it is because there are some officers who are going to find a way to deny you no matter what. But if you put together a great case, I mean, you can you can make it – if you have good facts and you put together a great case and you prepare well, you can make it almost impossible for the officer to deny you. Not impossible, but almost. Okay. Uh, uh, so Sunday on YouTube, next question, we'll go to TikTok, but Sunday on YouTube says, um, I also applied for my I-765, that's the work permit application. After my 150 days elapsed beginning of this month, when might I get my application approved or how can I track? Uh, well, you can't track it until you get a receipt notice for it that says, Hey, we got it and it's pending, but you might get the, you might get the approval before you get a receipt notice. So, or you might not just not get a receipt notice because it goes, it goes quickly. You'll probably get the approval in the next two or three weeks. It's been for most people, most of our clients, at least they've been getting the work permit uh, within about two months of applying for it. If it's the first time you're applying renewals, it, it, and it sounds like it is for you. Renewals of a asylum pending based work permit can are taking well over a year like 18 months or something so that's a wholly different story but for first time yeah it should be like you, you should be getting it soon okay um jacob duffy says what are the asylum approval rates for christians being persecuted in india I, I don't they don't they don't keep statistics on like that kind of thing but it's it it can be a good case we we, we won one just the other day we we got an approval or a couple of weeks ago we got an approval notice for an indian christian uh, who had gone through some rough stuff. And even if you haven't personally been through bad things yourself, there's still, you still may have a case just, just being a Christian um, these days, being from India and being a Christian may be enough to win because there's a lot of information out there. I know this because I worked on you know, these cases and I worked on this case that we won where we found that there's lots of good reports that say per Christians are persecuted, Christian and Muslims as well. Uh, Christians and Muslims, all religious minorities, but especially Christians and Muslims are being persecuted on a pretty grand scale lately in India. And so that can help you to win asylum. So yeah, Jacob, uh, could, could, be a, could be a good case. Call us if you want to talk about it, okay? Uh, so Gustavo says, do you still have free consultations? Uh, as of today, yes. As of today, yes. I said I was going to do it for free in August. I've kept doing it in September. I don't know if it's going to continue or not. So if you want it, if you want it to be free, uh, call it in. Okay, call it in. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to last or, or how long it's going to last. So uh, I'm going to put the number down at the bottom of the screen on YouTube and Facebook. It's also above my head on YouTube and Facebook, and then in the profile on other platforms. So seven one three nine zero nine zero four zero one is our number. Seven one three nine zero nine zero four zero one. Right now it's free. So if you want to take advantage of that. Give us a call today and get it set up, okay? It's called an asylum strategy session where we'll talk with you, see what we think, see if we think we can help you. And if so, how? And it doesn't matter whether you've already applied or not, whether you're thinking about applying or you've already applied. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether your case is or will be with 
USCIS or with immigration court. Either way, we, we help people with asylum in both scenarios, okay? So feel free to give us a call. I hope you will. Thank you for commenting, Gustavo. Uh, let's go to uh, TikTok. Okay, when you, what does it say, participate? Oh, when are you going to have the interview preparation stuff ready? Uh, yeah, so here's the thing. I created a course, a full-scale, super, super detailed, very detailed course uh, for inter interview preparation, for asylum interview preparation. Mainly fo it's focused on affirmative asylum interviews with USCIS, but I think you'd find it helpful if you're in immigration court too. So I did it in Spanish. I've written, I've written everything for it in English. Like I've written out the scripts and put together slideshows and like for the videos that I'm making for it because it's like video based. Uh, so I've done the written materials for it. I just haven't filmed the videos yet for it where like I'm reading the scripts over the slides and stuff uh, in English. So for Spanish speakers out there, you can find it at entrevistadeasilo.com, entrevistadeasilo.com. That, that's a free, it's a long detailed course. It's like almost two hours of like a, a training course on asylum interviews, okay? But then at the end of that, I, I tell you about a paid course where it costs money if you want to go really deep, if you want to go to the next level and you're really serious about it and you want to pay something for a lot more training, uh, then there's a paid course. So I haven't done that yet for English, but um, I'm going too soon, Okay. It's hard. It's a lot of it's a lot of work. I spent so much time on it already. Uh, so much time. It's but it's good. I'm I'm really proud of it. I think it's really good actually. So, so I will do it. I, I will do it in English. And um, uh, you'll know about it when I when it's done. You'll know about it. I'll be posting videos about it like every day on on all the platforms. So you'll know about it. Okay. Um, hopefully in the next like a few weeks or maybe a month or two, to be honest with you. It's, it's a lot of work because I, because I want to do it. I, I, when I do it, like I want to do it right, right and do it well. Like I don't want it to be half done, you know, crappy. The, the Spanish one is, I think, I think it's excellent, uh, but I'm biased, but now I just need to film it in English and put it up. All right. Uh, good question. This is one. That's the Alistair. Actually, hold on. Uh, all right, so we've gotten a couple of questions, both on YouTube and on TikTok, about the timelines for applying for citizenship based when you had asylum. Because I think you probably a lot of people know after you get asylum, one year after your approval date, you're eligible to apply for your green card. Okay, um, and then you have to wait four years to, after you get your green card, you have to wait four years to be eligible to apply for citizenship. So the question we've been getting on multiple platforms today is when we get this all the time is, well, okay, if it takes years to get your green card, does that time that you're waiting for your green card, does that count? Like, is that part of the four years you have to wait? So let's say you wait two years, like you apply for the green card and then it takes two years to get it. Then do you just have to wait two more years? Because the two years you waited plus the two years you had, the green card equals four. So can you apply for a citizenship then? No. Bummer. Bummer. Very unfortunate. I know it's very unfortunate. But no, it's not how it works. You can't – that, that, the time that you're waiting for the green card does not count towards your four years that you have to wait to be able to apply for citizenship. So I'm sorry to be the bearer of that bad news. Uh, Gustavo, so thanks. I'm loyal to these live videos. You're, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. Okay, uh, we've got on YouTube a question from Tyler. By the way, for those of you watching on TikTok and Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, go to, go to my YouTube channel. That's and subscribe there. Manning Asylum Law. That's where uh, I'm posting all my stuff, all my stuff, all my best stuff, like training, more, more detailed videos where I go into detail, like about the thing I talked about earlier today. And pretty much all the when, when I do these lives, I usually almost always start with a short talk about something, right? Some topic that people have been asking me about or that I think you need to know about as asylum seekers or people who are interested in asylum. Well, that's kind of superficial in these lies. I, I go into much more detail about these kinds of things in, in full scale or more thorough YouTube videos. So go to my YouTube channel, um, uh, Manning Asylum Law. If you go to YouTube and you search Manning Asylum Law, it'll come up. 
and subscribe to that, okay? So you can get all the information, all of my best stuff. Uh, and the same stuff that I post like on TikTok, the, everything I post on TikTok gets posted on YouTube Shorts as well. So you won't miss out on that stuff either. If you're if you're sort of focused on following me on, my, uh, on YouTube. All right, Tyler says, can you win asylum if the government is not the one who caused the harm? So if the government is not the persecutor, can you still win asylum? Yes, you can, but it's a little bit harder. You have to convince the asylum officer or immigration judge that the government is either unable or unwilling to control the persecutors. What does that mean? So basically, you've got to show that either the government sort of doesn't care, like they're not interested in trying to help you, either in your specific case. Like, so for example, if you, if let's say you get threats by some private group or some gang or some, some private guys, whatever. They're not from the government and you go to the police and you tell them about it and they blow you off and they're just like, no, yeah, don't worry about it. Like, or it's not, not our problem. That's like a family issue. Or that's a, whatever, a tribal issue. That's a, whatever, but not, not our problem. That would, that would show that they're unwilling. Okay. To control, to, to control the feared persecutors. Um, unable is meaning like they just are overwhelmed, overmatched. The authorities are no match for the persecutors. So like we see this, for example, in, in Central America, where um, uh, you know there's gangs, right? That that are the persecutors often, and you can sometimes make the argument in those cases that the government is unable to to do anything about it because the statistics just show that like there's so much violent crime by gangs that like you cannot with a straight face argue that the government's able to effectively control the gangs when the gangs just do whatever they want. And the statistics and the reports show this. So Tyler, to answer your question, the answer is yes, you can still win asylum, but you have to show that the government is either unable or unwilling to basically like help you. Okay. And it doesn't have to, but it doesn't have to be directly like related to you. You can, you can, you can show by reports or other circumstantial evidence circumstances that show that they're either likely unable or unwilling to to help people help you or people like like you people that are having problems like you or people that are hurt by the same people that you fear being hurt by okay so it's harder and also internal relocation becomes a bigger issue um, if you um, you have to also show that you can't just go somewhere else in your country and and be safe and because um, when it's the persecutors, the government, there exists what's called a rebuttable presumption. Basically, like it's assumed. It's assumed that, oh, okay, if the government's the persecutor, they control the whole country. They could probably find someone just about anywhere. So like you don't have to do much to, to pass this hurdle of this internal relocation question. But when it's a private uh, actor, it's harder. You got you to really like go out of your way to show that, look, Either they could find me anywhere or that it would be unreasonable for you to relocate somewhere else. And that can be that unreasonable part can be due to very many different things. It can be it's not just like I'll be persecuted. It's like any, any real hardships that you or your family members would endure are relevant to that internal relocation question. Uh, remember, what would happen to your family members is usually not relevant to you winning asylum, to you to you showing that you you're likely to be persecuted on account of a protected ground. But it is relevant to internal relocation. So, like, let's say you have a kid who needs certain medical treatment, and they can only get it uh, in the capital because that's where the decent, only decent medical facility that can treat this thing is. Well, it would not be reasonable for you to relocate somewhere else in the country because your, your child couldn't get medical care in this other places. So that would be relevant. That would help you to overcome this potential problem of internal relocation, keeping you from getting asylum. Okay. Habib, uh, Mohammed Habib says, starting with Manning Asylum Law next week. Can't wait. So, uh, so far, one word, professionalism. Ah, super, very, super kind of you. Thank you. I, and I look forward to you getting started with this. That's going to be great. I'm really excited to hear that. We, we look forward to supporting you. And thank you for the kind comment here today. That's very nice of you. Thanks, uh, Mohammed. That's awesome. Uh, let's see. 
All right. So one more question uh, on TikTok. So an immigrant who crossed the border and got married to a U.S. citizen, can they apply for adjustment of status? Yes. If you came to the United States without permission, whether whether you like got caught and then they let you in um, and they said you can go in um, under, uh, what's the phrase in English? I keep thinking of it in Spanish. Um, not parole, but um, Libertad. What is that word in English? Where they give you, where you have to pay a bond, you know, and they say, okay, you can go into the country, you're free. Um, whether whether you get in like that, or whether you came across the border and you just never got caught, um, and you got in without getting contact with any immigration authorities, in both cases, yes. If you it doesn't matter. If you marry a U.S. citizen, yeah, you can get a green card. You you can do adjustment of status, which is the name for the process of getting a green card. And with, a, with marriage to a U.S. citizen, you can do that without having to even ever like leave the country. There's other circumstances where if you get married or to get a green card, you would have to, if you came here without permission, you would have, you might, you might be able to get that green card. But as part of the process, you would have to leave the country and get this thing called a waiver to be able to come back in. It's a big deal and it's time consuming and, and it's kind of hard to get. So luckily though, if you marry a US citizen, it's just it's straightforward and it's easy. The answer is yes, you can do it, okay? All right, uh, that is it for today. So it's Friday, 2.25 where I am. I'm in Texas, uh, so we're on central time. So it's, it's close to time to start the weekend. Not quite here, we got a little bit more work to do. At Manning Asylum Law to finish up. Uh, <laughs> bail. Uh, Demo. Demo, is that my friend Demo? My former colleague Demo? Uh, <laughs> is that you <laughs> on, on YouTube? Bail. Uh, yeah, I think bail is a word I was looking for. Uh, yeah, where they let you go without uh, where you pay. Yeah, they let you go by. But there's some. There's also some other term for it. Uh, I know what Demo grows to. Is that, is that my former colleague from the embassy? Let me know. Um, all right. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> he says yeah, it is cool, man. Good to good to see you. Uh, send me a note. Let me know where you where you are, what you're doing. All right, uh, that's it. Out. Have a good, have a great weekend. I'm gonna try to get on live sometime this weekend. I'm not sure Saturday or Sunday, but hopefully, if you if you're online, stop by and say hi, everyone. And I will see you later. Take care. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you.